Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Due Dates Matter, an online professional development seminar sponsored by the National Council for History Education and the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs at the National Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Now, before we get underway, I'd like to introduce both the National Council for History Education and the National Humanities Center to you. The NCHE is an organization that provides advocacy on educational issues, wonderful annual conferences. I was at the NCHE conference over the weekend in Charleston, South Carolina. They provide webinars and publications. And all of this can come to you if you're a member of NCHE. And to become a member, you simply go to www.nche.net, and there you'll find all about the National Council for History Education, and you'll learn how to become a member. Now, the other co-conspirator in this evening's party is the National Humanities Center, which is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. It's located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and its main mission is to provide fellowships to scholars from all over the world who come to the center for an academic year to research and write books and articles on topics in history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. The center also maintains a vigorous outreach program to teachers, particularly American history teachers and literature teachers. We do that through our online seminars. Our new online seminar schedule for next fall is up on our website. Please check it out. I think you'll find some interesting topics. In addition, we offer a website called TeacherServe, which offers essays by leading scholars on religion in American history, the environment in American history, and African-American literature and history. These, thought, these essays illuminate the topics and also provide some advice on how to teach them. In addition, we provide you with primary resources through our toolbox library. Each one of the items you see there in the toolbox library is a teaching anthology that includes historical documents, literary text, images, audio material, all organized thematically within chronological frames. They come illuminated by extensive notes and interpretive questions, and they're ideal for classroom instruction. Now, when this seminar is over, we ask you to return to the website, the website you use to obtain the text for the seminar. There you will find a recording of this, evening, uh, of this evening's proceedings, and you will also find a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, which we are wel you're welcome to plunder. If you see anything in the PowerPoint you'd like to bring into your classes, the PowerPoint presentation is there for you to steal from. In addition, you will find our online evaluation. Please click on that, fill it out, and submit it to us online. It's very important to us. We want to know what you think about this, this evening's seminar. You will receive from the National Humanities Center documentation of participation. This will be an email letter uh, that you can submit to your local certifying authority to obtain whatever recertification your participation in this seminar warrants. Now, how do you participate? Well, you can participate in two ways, and we hope you will, both ways. If you want to speak up, you can click on the little hand-raised icon that you see next to my arrow. When you do that, the hand will appear here next to your name, I will see that and I will pass the microphone to you. You'll know that your microphone is turned on when the icon goes green. You'll notice all of your icons right now are red. If you'd rather uh, chat, you can put your cursor in the chat box here, type your message, click on the send button, and your message will appear here. I will bring the chat into the discussion as uh, we go along. So. Uh, uh, you needn't worry about uh, getting your comments into the discussion by virtue of chat. So are there any questions before we begin? Any, any, are we ready to go? If you're ready to go, ladies and gentlemen, send me a little smiley face so that I'll know we can begin. Uh, there we go, Ginger Park has sent me some. Let's see. Oh, uh, they're coming in now. That always, always brightens my day when I see all those little smiley faces next to your names. Great, okay, well then let's get underway and find out if dates matter. Our goals this evening are simple. We have two. We hope that the seminar will help you understand why thinking about time matters. And we also seek to provide historical approaches to teaching about time. To do all that, we're happy to have with us this evening Dr. Deborah Smith Johnson, who is the upper school history department head at the Lakeside School in Seattle, Washington. Deborah is a world history teacher, and she has wide experience in teaching. She's taught in public and private schools, uh, and she has taught teachers and graduate students and high school students. So let me turn the proceedings over to Deborah, 
and she is now in charge of the PowerPoint. And let me ask, Deborah, do Hello. votes matter? Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, I am thrilled to be here this evening, and it's uh, also my first on this side of the webinar, so uh, I'm looking forward to, to being here. And, and of course, because I can't see body language this evening, I look forward to kind of seeing what you're thinking through the chat and, uh, and your questions. Uh, I think that uh, I also wanted to thank you all for participating in the survey prior to the webinar. That really helped me think about what we wanted to do today. So I have several key questions that are listed here, but as Richard said, really it comes down to this seminar for the next hour and a half will be split into two parts. Really, how do we think about time in our classrooms and how do we teach about time? So both kind of the conceptual piece, what the historians do and how we have to process that for students, and then also what students do in terms of uh, the, the uh, actual activities that we do in our classroom. So I hope you walk away with some content as well as, as uh, a lot of things for your grab bag, uh, your toolkit as you leave for your classroom. So uh, just a little bit from the survey, oh, and a, and a comment as, as we go through here tonight, there have been, there's several places in the slides where I've, I've kind of thrown in a question in red uh, on the, the PowerPoint that I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, but uh, obviously any other time as well. Um, a few of the, the conclusions from the survey, 68% uh, of you either agree or strongly agree that dates are important, um, and most of you um, believe that periodization is something that we should do in our classrooms, and that it's not so much about information retrieval any longer, but it is about the skills needed to process that information, uh, which is what we as, as history teachers need to now do in our classrooms. And I was really surprised by this last statistic. Uh, over 80% over of you agree that pacing the world history uh, survey might be challenging, but it's fun. And so let's have some fun tonight. Okay, Deb, I think your microphone may be a little too close to you. Matthew, could you move it back Great. just a little bit? Is that better now? That's better, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so uh, I just pulled two quotes from the survey. Um, one of the things that that uh, one participant said is they really wanted to figure out how do you how do you make this world history survey this behemoth of a course not just about dates and help them process um, things and then uh, and also help them understand things without memorizing but really thinking about why why uh, understanding the larger sequence of things is important so here we go um, many of you judging from the survey have had varying degrees of world history backgrounds. Um, there are in the group people who've never taught as well as people who've taught for 36 years. And so a wide variety of experience, uh, both in terms of content and time. Um, one of the things that, that I wanted to put up first is just a definition of what world history is. Uh, I think what what uh, we're not going to do tonight is talk about specifically, say, AP world history or Western Civ versus world history. Um, but but it seemed from the survey that there's there is a variety of of, of perspectives there. So just to read this definition because I think it's important that we all start on the same page. Uh, world history is about developing a world view. Uh, it asks us to look for those global patterns as we consider what has drawn history our humanity together through time and space. And of course, there are multiple paths possible, so world history allows us to look at those local case studies to see how people and societies have responded to global challenges in interacting with, with each other and with our environment. Now, that of course means that we don't have to do everything, and I think that's the biggest misconception with world history is that feeling like, well, I've got a 700-page textbook here. I have to do every page of it, or they have to know every single date that's in it. Um, we as teachers can really be more selective and help our students process that information, uh, particularly in this day and age where they can just Google it or look it up on their, on, uh, their handheld device or whatever else. So feel free to chime in with questions at any time if you've got questions out there. Um, my agenda for this evening is roughly here. Uh, we've got, uh, we're gonna look first of all at how we, how we have students think about time. I wanna look closely at those five dates that you chose. Um, think about how we pace the course. Look specifically at how African and Chinese history have been periodized. And then spend some, some real time 
going through a bunch of different lessons on teaching that time and also hearing from you in terms of how you do it in your classroom. One of the things that came out in the survey, interestingly enough, um, as we looked at these 21st century skills, um, about half of the ones that were listed uh, as, I, as I processed them all have to do with time. Um, clear, and, and it's not that geography and media literacy and writing and analysis and reading and verbal presentation aren't important too, but it was interesting how many of our, of our assumptions do, uh, do come right into those time ones that are on the right there. Um, and so those are the main ideas that we'll be, we'll be talking about as we go through here uh, this evening. We have, uh, I did, oh, let me move forward. Um, and so one of the, the first questions is if, if you guys want to start chatting over there, um, just how do we think about time? Um, when you actually think about, not just teach about it, but when you think about time uh, in terms of how you organize uh, uh, your history classrooms or your history course, um, what, what's the role of time in, 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 your, in your teaching? So this quote from the National Standards, chronology provides the mental scaffolding for organizing historical thought. Uh, some of the brain research dictates that, that if we give students a temporal um, kind of map in their brain, then they have a place to kind of uh, put things as, as we go through the course. Um, some of that's done by timeline, might be done through periodization, which we'll talk about, might be done through giving students some tools in terms of thinking about um, what else is happening at the same time on those, uh, uh, it's not, at the same time as an event in another part of the world. So um, what questions did you ask yourself as you chose the dates that you did? Um, so when I asked you to choose five events, any five events in world history that you thought all students should know leaving your course, um, what were the, the kinds of things that, that came up? And I'm just going to use one of those wait time moments here and see if we get any action off to the side here. Okay, we have a question on the table. What questions did you come up with as you were preparing uh, for uh, the seminar? Uh, okay, we had someone who thought they were asking for the mic, but uh, I'm sure that was not one of the questions here. John writes, the question I asked first was, do these have to cover the whole course of history? A question you're going to address later, Deb. And then Simone writes, the way I thought about it was like landmarks along the road of history. Okay. I consider well, their significance. Hey, Deb? Yeah, no, I think, I think those are really interesting questions because you kind of look at what is the agenda, first of all, of, of these questions. Um, are these markers that, you know, are these the only five dates that, that students will know? And we probably would hope that our students remember perhaps more than five events in history. Uh, but what I did was, was come up, made a list of all of those events that everyone said uh, on their list, and I did put that compiled list onto the Moodle site, so you can actually go to that um, and look at that. But one of the things that, that uh, as, as we consider those questions, um, we wonder, are there particular events that we privilege because of our own particular worldviews based on where we've traveled? what region of the world we've studied, what we think world history is, what we happen to be teaching this week. Um, so for example, um, just uh, perhaps you can use your smiley faces again, or the fact that, you know, did anyone choose a date specifically because that was your lesson that you were doing in class that day? Um, so um, I think that's, that's uh, a moment. We had, while we're waiting, we had some, um, uh, responses here. Some folks have, have, have continued to write about the, the, the great event or the watersheds and turning points and landmarks, but then Jan writes that she thinks of time in chunks. And then uh, Blair writes, I was trying to think about moments of interaction. Good point. Also, I was trying to think about whether they were moments that were illustrative of moments common in all geographical areas. That's an excellent point. Um, chunks are great. Uh, Jamie writes, I am mostly worried about students caring about what they are learning. My students love U.S. history but despise world, so adding humanity to the periods is important to me. Again, we talk about events and historical moments, so those seem to be the, the major organizing principles. And we will come back to those chunks shortly as we talk about periodization, because in fact that is what periodization does. Uh, and so I think it is, and it is 
an absolutely important um, piece where we where we where we have students be engaged, and oftentimes that means if, if there's an event in the past that connects to something that's happening now, um, that makes it more real to students. So, for example, I was teaching um, much more about Egypt and Muhammad Ali and Nasser over the last couple of months than I probably remember doing the last couple of years because there were some connections to the present there. Um, as we so so feel free to continue this discussion as we get into this um, and. Uh, but just to frame frame the, the thinking about those events, um, you might have chosen events based on the fact that, that you're a big historian, and some of you may or may not be familiar with that term. Big history is a field within world history um, that kind of looks at history from the Big Bang to the present, and they would argue there's really only two dates that are important, the Neolithic Revolution and the Industrial Revolution. Um, you may have also been influenced by you know, how long your world history course is, whether or not you teach AP, who your audience is, if you have a, a primarily US history background um, or a Western Civ background. So here's the big moment. Here were our top, oops, almost, um, our top hits. Um, the five most popular ones uh, were included the Neolithic Revolution, the rise and fall of Rome, the birth and spread of Islam, uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, World War One, and World War II, um, and I've listed the other contenders there on the slide. Uh, love to hear some observations you have from just looking at that that top hit list. Um, note that there were about 38 people last I looked at the survey who responded, and our top hits were at about 13. So clearly, there were lots of other events as well that people chose from. Mm -hmm. Well, Jamie writes, he's also influenced by the fact that his world history course is the rise of Islam to the French Revolution. Uh, weird periods to cover. Modern world is way more popular with my kids. So any other contenders for history's greatest hits? Um, my, you know, when I was looking over this list, it seemed clear to me that there was no consensus. The fact that, that even the most popular topic had only 13 hits in, in, in the scheme of 60-some of, uh, some, the, the list of 60 some of that's came in. So there really is not an established canon, per se, of, of uh, world history. Um, many of the events that were on the list in, you know, one or twos or threes or fours or even sevens or eights um, had to do with political military history, uh, empires, intellectual ideas. Um, they tended, as a general rule, to be rather Eurocentric and not about Latin America or Africa. Um, and again, you only had five five events, um, but that also reflects the fact that in the survey, people were were saying that the fact that there aren't as many resources and there they wish there was more professional development and they had more background perhaps in Latin America or African Middle Eastern history. So that 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 did kind of coincide there. Uh, but we'll we'll get into a little bit more of this as well as we as we go through. There is a um, additional resource on the website called Must Know Dates, and this is something that uh, another I've given credit to the teacher who who developed this list on there. Um, but she came up with a list for each time period of kind of what she would consider to be must know dates. Um, and so you know there there is an answer key in there and and all that and and one would. Um, one could certainly have students look at that list and, and you could decide how you might want to use that. But I would encourage you also to have students think about, um, you know, are there, are there certain processes or things that, inventions, technologies that are developed that you can't necessarily pinpoint a date to? And what are they going to do with those dates now? Beth, we have a question here from John Ramsbottle. Let me pass the microphone to him. John, the microphone's all yours. Hi, John. Hi, Doug. Hi. Thanks very much for this. I certainly appreciate the polling. Um, about the date, roughly 1500, that comes up a few times in our readings. Mm -hmm. And I think there's maybe an argument for including that in terms of interaction. Uh, but I also confess a certain Eurocentric bias in that, as the article said, it relates to early modern. That's right, curious. that's I think. I'm, I'm wondering what people think about that, 1492 or 1500. Uh, is that too Eurocentric to suggest that that is 
a significant global turning point? I think that's a great question, uh, and, and I'll just speak to it for a minute, but then I'd love to hear more more comment on that. Uh, I think Peter Perdue's article in the reading does address that, exactly that, and he makes the case that, in fact, he doesn't believe that it's a Eurocentric date because of what happens afterwards. So world historians will often argue that there's a certain time marker that you can choose, and it's a watershed moment because not so much because of what happened in 1492, but what happens over the course of the next 100 years um, or so. Um, there are world historians who would argue that 1492 got Europe on, on the train, um, able to participate in the global economy in a very real way for the first time, but that actually doesn't make a difference in terms of them being the engineer on the train, say, until perhaps as late as the early 1800s. Uh, and so, you know, there's a whole debate in Rise of the West historiography that's really fascinating. There's a lot of great resources on that that look at exactly that question. Um, but it, it's, a it's a question that students love to debate. Um, and there are, there are some very short kind of readings also that go at exactly that. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a very debatable question and we could have a lot of fun with that if we wanted to go further. Deb, along those same lines, Jeff Shearer has written that he's wondering uh, why history isn't viewed more generatively. For instance, why was the 16th century a potent era yielding Reformation, Renaissance, Elizabethans arising from movable pipe, the democratization of literature? Uh, it seems to be a very good point. Why, why don't you have those, those generative moments, or do you? Or why doesn't it focus on, why does the world history focus on them, or does it? I think we do. I think that one of the things that, that the challenge for world historians is to find the a more universal experience than is one that is shared by regional histories. And so a world historian would argue that we absolutely need European historians to look at the intellectual developments in Europe in the 16th century uh, and that the history needs to include those. We're going to draw upon those when we ask our world more world historical questions. But the kinds of questions that world historians might be interested in is, was there also a renaissance in Korea at the same time as there was a renaissance in Europe? Say? Mm -hmm. So, so, and I think there's some good actually scholarship that roughly at the same time there were some really exciting things happening in the arts in Korea. And so I think world historians are going to use the information that regional historians develop um, to then make those bigger comparisons to look at the commonalities as well as the differences between those, those experiences. I see. So it's kind of a major act of contextualization. The world historians take the work of the regional historians and contextualize it into larger, broader themes. Exactly. Oh, okay. All right. We have about an hour, a little, more, a little over an hour. Okay. We're going to move forward. Uh, and so one of the, the things we get when we, when we have this focus on dates often and, and you know, it's the, the kind of we, we want to make sure students have the evidence and the content and the detail, um, but every time we add more on, more layers and layers and layers to, to, the, to the survey course, you know, because we want to make sure we're doing Africa and want to make sure we're doing Latin America, um, we get to the point of content overload. And so what one of the, the things that world historians do need to do is dare to admit. Um, so how do we select, how do we do, how do we pare this course down so it's a course that's engaging so that as, the, as one participant earlier had said that they like world history, history just as much as they like U.S. history. Um, it's not just one damn thing after another kind of thing. Uh, and so this quote, uh, courses vary from teacher to teacher, but the dominant pedagogical model is coverage, a metaphor suggesting professors in biplanes broadcasting pages of knowledge over acres and acres of students. Um, which is which is just you know that imagery that you see right there is often how we feel particularly as we get closer to the end of the year and we're trying to get through whatever material before an AP test or a Regent test or whatever other state exam that there might be and we we feel like we've got to cover cover cover. So one of the the uh, I would I would love to talk for a few minutes just about how how we do set aside pacing the course. Um, and if anyone's got some successful tips to share in terms of how you approach it, one of the questions I've gone ahead and and uh, and put in the the questions there was 
how do you sit down to pace out your curriculum over the course of the year? And the article by Angela and Chris had gone through some of their strategies. Um, I want, I'm just going to talk about a few ideas, and then I'd love to hear more from you in terms of how you approach it. Um, I think it really is important, and oftentimes new teachers um, have the biggest uh, have the have the, this is the biggest challenge for them is to take the school calendar at the beginning of the year and to take your units that you're going to do and divide it up right then and stick to it for the year. So that way you do end up making sure that you get to the present if if that is the the uh, the nature of the course um, over the course of the year. Um, so once you've set aside those big units. Um, you actually start perhaps next, or you're put in next year assessment. Um, how do how do we want um, how do we want to assess that particular unit? Are we going to do a essays or a more objective test or whatever else? And then, as a world history person, I find that I've had to learn how to multitask uh, much more than perhaps I I used to. Uh, and so I want to target what skills I want students to learn over the course of that unit. And and for each skill, or in the course of each skill, I'll I'll choose some topics. Um, but I'll I'm not going to sit down with a textbook per se and base it upon the textbook because then I'm going to be beholden to the textbook and not beholden to what I think is what's going to say keep students engaged. It doesn't mean that it's going to be any less content rich necessarily, um, but it does mean that that I'm not going to be lockstep necessarily with with a particular uh, publisher's approach to how to teach my course. And I know that might be um, controversial, so I'd love to hear, obviously, there are downsides and upsides to that. So are there any comments on, on I think Angela and Chris called them time bandits, um, you know, places where you, you fall into, well, I really have to spend two weeks on the French Revolution, um, or this was really exciting, These all the, the revolts that have been happening in, in uh, the Middle East and North Africa in the last couple of months, and I have to admit that it became a, a significant time bandit for me, and, and I think I'm two weeks, last couple of weeks there. In the meantime, uh, while, while we're asking people about uh, time bandits and strategies and pitfall, pitfalls, a theme has developed in the chat about getting buy-in from students. And John writes, getting buy-in depends upon appealing to their interests, what issues are in the media. So they're, they're your time bandits, Deb. Freedom, women's rights, Islamic head coverings, et cetera, et cetera. But how far ahead can one foresee? So you can never predict where those time bandits are going to come up. Uh, Andrew writes, the idea of coverage is an interesting one. It makes me wonder if this idea of coverage is directly related to student learning. There's been a good deal of discussion in the chat about student learning. Uh, let's see, uh, Jamie writes, uh, it's only my second year, but I'm going to start with a broad timeline at the beginning of the year next year and add as we go on in a project-based organization. So she might be able to, uh, through her project, shape, uh, shape her course around some, uh, some issues that arise during the course. And Beth writes, we are required to use backward design for our courses, but seldom get to the last 20 years. Some good comments, Deb. Yeah, well, I think I think those all address exactly the challenges that we have in the world history course, and the question of engaging students, I think, is a really important one. And and as we get to the second half of the webinar in about 15 minutes, um, we'll really talk about what are some strategies that we can use to get students really connected to to uh, world history and and involved in in shaping the course for themselves. Um, one of the one of the issues in terms of the the current event focus is actually putting in a you know a regular current event um, opportunity for students once every week, once every two weeks. And I know that feels like a big burden at times. Um, I found that once every two weeks works really well, and I'll often assign a current event that ties into what we're doing in history. So, for example. Um, when we were talking about the Haitian Revolution a few weeks ago, we were looking at the one-year anniversary of the Haitian earthquake from last year. When we were looking at uh, coffee and silver slave trade, we were looking at fair trade in, in the economy today. So sometimes by coming up with that common theme between the past and the present, you're automatically engaging students because they they are can find articles in their world or news in their world about those different kinds of topics. 
So. Okay, we've had a number of comments here. <clears throat> uh, let's see, Jen writes, I had students keep a current, a, went out of my side there, a current events journal throughout the year and write a weekly entry related to a theme in world history. And another person gets Upfront Magazine, but now budget constraints have ended that. We don't try to get into current events. Um, great idea that's worked for me, writes Blair, uh, has been to watch one minute BBC News review at the very beginning of each class. This sometimes leads to great discussion and connections with the material. And Ginger writes in regard to current events, I used to have students write three questions with answers for current events once a week. Then I would take them and have a Jeopardy game with them. You know, lots of good suggestions. Right? And, I, and I fully recognize the fact that oftentimes current events can be those time bandits, um, but I also know that that often is, is where you get your hook to start the class and to actually make the, it relevant to students. And, and one of the things I'll argue by the end of the seminar tonight is that, in fact, um, as history teachers, we have an obligation to teach not only the past, but also the present and the future. So as if we weren't overwhelmed enough by just having to teach the first 10,000 years. So, but we'll come back to that shortly. Blair agrees. Relevance is worth the time. Suck it up, he says. <laughs> Um, I wanted to show you this switchback chart just to give you a sense of maybe a student perspective on um, from a textbook. So this was uh, the the um, uh, about 10 years ago, but a an organization did a look at uh, how textbooks um, do the chronological do the chronological pacing of of the world through time. And if you can read close, I know it's a little bit hard on the screen, um, you can see that there are these huge switchbacks back and forth um, for the, particularly the early times and the non-European times. As we get more modern, um, you'll see that there are very, very short times within European history um, where students are, are, are able to really get into depth on a particular topic. But when we're talking about Africa or the Americas or medieval Japan or China, there are these long stretches that students really um, see all of African history at once. Um, and one of the problems with that is they don't tend to see those continuity, continuities and changes as clearly. Uh, and it also then, if you base your text if you base your course upon the way the textbook's going, they're also going through those switchbacks and they're not able to really plan. Um, they're not able to see world history uh, in a dynamic sense, uh, in an equal sense around the world. If that makes sense. Uh, so one of the ways that we help to try to organize history for them is through periods. And uh, periodization, I'm just going to read this first sentence. I think uh, this is a nice definition that André Gunderfrank used, is that the, the categorization of change into roughly coherent segments is what distinguishes an analytical approach to the factors of time, what historians call periodization, from the memorized dates of a mindless chronology. So it's, it's, again, taking what a participant said shortly ago, um, it's making our dates into chunks. So rather than just thinking about them as isolated snapshots through history, what we're actually looking at is chunks of time that allow students to analyze what was happening during that time period. And um, we've got some, uh, several kind of um, slides here that, that go into how people have have tried to conceptualize time in, in history. And, and I'm not going to go through each of these, but this is all the scholarship that's out there. And, and you could look at any one of these world historians and, and look at how they've decided to treat time, whether it be just looking at one year, like 1968, by um, a book by Mark Kurlansky, who looks at all the things that were happening around the world in 1968, or looking at more of a thematic chronology um, for example, Bentley, which was the optional reading on cross-cultural interaction, um, or, or a, a, another, other varieties that are listed there. I wanted to uh, show you one interesting one and just get your thoughts on this. Um, Richard Eaton, uh, about a decade ago, came up with this periodization, and he basically organized time based on commodity. So looking at, from the beginning, um, what, what was the major kind of commodity of usage um, of significance at that time? And so he decided to periodize all of history based on, on these commodities. 
Um, other commodity periodizations might be, for example, there's a, there's a book that's been popular kind of amongst some world history teachers called The Six Glasses of World History, which takes six beverages, beer, wine, spirit, uh, tea, coffee, tea, and Coke, and organizes all of human history around those beverages. Um, these are wonderful ways to get students invested in what they're doing. They critique, for example, this particular chart that I have in front of you um, and really argue whether or not that commodity, say sugar from 1500 to 1800, really can be used as a way of teaching those 300 years. So what are the kinds of global processes that students would have to understand to think uh, if, if uh, in order to explain the history of the whole world, for those 300 years through the eyes of sugar. I don't know if anyone has any comments on that or questions or wants to challenge any of these commodities, and I do have students often want to replace these with, with something else. That's a great question. <clears throat> Why would sugar organize the history of the world for 300 years? I'd never thought of that. So do we have any, any, any takers to the question then? What do you have to know to understand how a commodity could organize the history of the world. Okay, love the use of commodities. If kids could explain why that commodity was significant, they would really understand the global picture. That's true. That's true. So what would they have so to do? Jen, so Jen, if I could put you on the spot for a moment, since I noticed that was you just in the chat there. Um, what what are some of the global processes in, um, that students might know? So what what's happening in the world between 1500 and 1800 that is affecting sugar, that's producing sugar? Okay. Slavery. So okay. certainly the, the global slave uh, networks, um, as well as the, the Columbian Exchange, and so you have have the, the growth of the movement of sugar plantations from the Eastern Hemisphere, which had spread from the Indian Ocean and, and after it was crystallized in the crystallized forms in, in India through the Canary Islands and over to the Americas. You've got the movement of slaves to, to work on those plantations. Um, and then you have a lot of thinking then about responses to that. So you could bring in Candide, for example, here, um, Voltaire's writing, which is a wonderful world history book, satire, that then critiques the growing of sugar um, when uh, Candide encounters a, a slave who's lost a limb in Suriname um, when he's traveling. And then uh, this is all for the price of sugar, I think, is the line in the book. And so, again, you can, you can bring in the Enlightenment as well as global slave trade, as well as, as uh, the Columbian Exchange, all through the eyes of that, that commodity. And certainly nutritional products as well and, and, and uh, demographic um, changes as a result of the movement of those foods across the Atlantic um, to both Asia as well as Europe and Africa. Mm -hmm. You'd also have to know something about the, uh, the rise of social fashion because what one, one element that drove the popularity of sugar was the rise of tea drinking and cocoa drinking and coffee drinking in uh, Europe. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we have a question here. Jenny raises a good question. Um, when, you have, when you use these commodities as organizing principles, um, doesn't that lend itself to a focus on economics? And other people have wondered that too. Is it, is it too much of a focus <clears throat> on economics? I think that's a great question. I think uh, world historians have been critiqued, particularly over the last decade, um, that uh, you know there's a lot of textbooks that seem to focus um, too much attention on economics, and I think that is why you need to make sure you counter or include also other other parts of the story. So, for example, bringing in Candide um, to also talk, you know, about the political, intellectual kinds of things that are work that are are going on at the same time. But um, absolutely, when you're using co commodities, um, it can uh, end up with an economic focus. But it can also um, lend itself nicely to a focus on the environment and technology. And I think one of the hottest areas of world history um, work right now is in environmental world history. Mm -hmm. Claudia asks, um, would you extend the cotton dates to the mid-1800s? She asks about the role of Egypt in India in the growing of cotton. Would it make sense to extend that? I think that is actually a wonderful question because that's what you want students to do is exactly interact with periodization in just this way. Um, you want them to be critiquing those end dates, those beginning dates, and what the actual periods are called. You have an activity 
on the website where all the readings are. Um, that is called periodization um, briefs. And what I have my students do at the end of the year is is I gave I've given them 18 different periods. Say, for example, the age of exploration, which some would argue uh, the age of exploration is from 1800 to uh, or I'm sorry, from from uh, 1400 to 1700. Say, I think in the the I put 1450 to 1600 on their actual handout, and they um, would then have to be in pairs, and one would argue, no, that's not the right name of that period, or no, those aren't the right dates, because that doesn't take into account, say, the Vikings or the Phoenicians or earlier explorers. But the other student might argue, well, in fact, uh, those um, that's the time of most intense exploration. So even though it was all those dead guy, white guys in tights, um, that was when most of of the, the things were happening at that time. And so they can have some really interesting debates. And so I think that's exactly what you want to do. And by having those debates and actually getting into the, the, the kind of conversations about periodization, you're having them analyze and use time in a way that, that I think is, is much richer than having them make sure they, they remember, you know, the, the 15 most important dates associated with um, whatever, whatever time period. We're getting some really good suggestions for resources here in the chat, and I would urge the people who are sending them here to also put them on the seminar form. That way, people will be alerted to them when they are up, when they are posted, and people have easy access to them. So please use that form uh, after the seminar to, to post these resources. They're, they're really rich. I'll also um, just mention that up on the seminar forum is also four bibliographies, one on scholarship, one abbreviated one, and one longer one, and then one website linkage one um, of all resources um, in world history that, that uh, I put up there, and many of those are annotated and, and listed. I would also urge people, people are putting up in the chat a lot of really good teaching uh, strategies. And again, please put those on the form. They will be, uh, people will be aware of them, and they'll be much easier to access. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how can I read some of that chat later, too, because I'm, I'm not able to catch it all right now. Um, so suffice it to say that I think when we, when we ask students to think about periodization, it does allow us to ask new questions, just like the ones you've been asking here. So, uh, for example, um, er, this quote uh, from, from uh, Magan Kieta at Villanova, um, he argues that air pollution in the 20th century has killed more people than the world wars combined. He asked, what does that say about how we should organize our teaching about the 20th century? Should we continue to, for example, organize it around the world wars, the Cold War? Or perhaps should we begin to shake things up a bit and decide that it's more important to organize the 20th century around energy use, for example, um, and bring in more of the um, thinking about why certain conflicts have happened in terms of oil use over the century, um, but also what are the effects of industrialization, um, the intensity of industrialization, what are the effects of, of the reliance um, that many nations now have on nuclear power, for example, uh, as well. So uh, again, just a very rich uh, conversation uh, you could have with students about, you know, why not organize the 20th century around energy instead of around, around uh, wars or, or the Cold War. My colleague, Karen Koplick, has just said that she can post the chat <clears throat> to the form as a separate document. So we'll, we'll hold her to that. So uh, when this is over, go check the form, and you'll be able to see all the chat there. There's a few more things I just want to go over briefly in terms of periodization. I want to uh, just a little bit about specifically Africa and then also China and then wrap up with really looking at how we might assess student thinking about periodization and then get into some, some teaching strategies for the remainder of the session. So first on Africa, uh, I gave uh, you a link uh, that many of you may have had a chance to go to on African timelines, and those timelines, extensive, I realize, um, gave you lots of, probably much more than you need, uh, information about Africa. Uh, and so one of the questions I wanted to throw out here is when, when do you teach about Africa? Is it as an isolated place, or is it in the context of another, um, 
of, an, of a period of time, um, of an event, of a theme. Um, when we try to integrate, for example, the teaching of Africa, sometimes students can see those connections between places. The disadvantage is by going into depth in a region, then students get to know that place a little bit more. How do you teach about Africa? Okay. In connection to the spread of Islam and the Indian Ocean trade routes? Right. Um, and so, so that's exactly what I was referring to in terms of that contextualization is, is if we're bringing up of Africa, uh, up Africa, for example, when we're, we're talking about, and actually, um, any of these different kinds of topics, it's, they're not African specific necessarily, um, but they do show the Africa in that wider global context. Um, that can help students remember things that might put more of an emphasis on the comparisons and the connections as opposed to the, the specificity of detail or date. Um, and those are obviously debates that we need to have and, 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 and think about as we, as we go through the course. Um, yeah, go ahead, Richard. Well, I was just going to say in the chat, the themes of migration, slavery, trade, and the spread of Islam seem to be general uh, in the teaching of Africa. And I was surprised at the number of ways in which Islam came up as one of our top five events that people felt was really important to make sure that we, we convey. I'm not surprised, but I think it was it's noteworthy um, that that came up. And so certainly it does come up in the teaching of African history as well as, as others. We have a question, a good question from Anthony here. Do any experienced world history teachers find that much of their treatment of sub-Saharan Africa relates to how the Western world interacted with the continent? I think that's such an important question. That's actually one of the things that um, it was noteworthy by that set of timelines that you looked at in the fourth period. The name of that period is anti-colonialism and reconstruction as opposed to calling it European imperialism. And so it's much more about the responses of Africans to what was happening um, to them, to their empire societies as opposed to um, to what the Europeans were doing. And, and it, is a, it is a different framing of the question. It's an important, important idea to note. Um, so for example, when we teach about the Cold War, it is possible to teach the Cold War just through African eyes. And I did it as an experiment this year. Um, I spent a day talking about you know, Truman and, and the, you know, the kind of big picture of the Cold War, but then the next week talking about just really using several examples in Africa to teach the Cold War, the 50-year period of the Cold War. So we were able to talk about Lumumba and the Congo and Nasser and the Suez Crisis and uh, uh, Tanzania and, and a couple other situations. And again, so we were doing that big global event through the eyes of, of Africa. And it seemed, it seemed to be really effective as a way of really bringing out, up the um, – the importance of the non-aligned movement and also proxy wars and, and other things. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, and so uh, what I, again, just think, thinking about the periodization of, of Africa, you know, you can come up with any number of different topics. Um, you could call that time um, between well, I, on the second one that's listed on this slide here, the Age of Unity, if we're going to be thinking about the first Pan-Africanist con conference in 1919 to the new naming of the African Union in 2002, or we could talk about the Age of Resistance, which is really from the first, first colonial, um, well, not the first, but the first significant colonial resistance in Africa to 1980 when the end of the, the Rhodesian War of Independence um, or any other kind of configurations. And again, what you want students to be doing is just interacting with this material. The more they're thinking about it and, and, which, uh, and what the periodization should be, the, the, more, the more meaningful it is to them. And you're having them do good analysis and really get into, get into this historical debate. Mm -hmm. The <clears throat> number of folks have commented on how inspired the idea of teaching the cohort through African eyes is, do you have a lesson plan or a curriculum that you might be able to post in the forum to share? Uh, I would be happy to. And just as a quick aside, um, one easy way to get to that would be to one of the resources at the end of the website will be one on AP Central. Uh, is AP Central and the world history materials there. And there is a unit that's up there called teaching about uh, teaching um, 
Latin America and Africa in the 20th century. And there's a whole section in there specifically comparing the Congo crisis and in and Lumumba with um, Pinochet and Allende in Chile. It's a really nice comparison of the Cold War and you can teach, it's actually teaching the Cold War through those regional eyes. And I took that and just did a lot more with it this year. Um, but I'd be happy to share offline, you know, anything that people would like. Okay, so watch the forum, folks. Okay. And so um, I, we can, we can, I'd, I'd be happy to answer more questions about Africa and African periodization, but just in the interest of time, I'm going to move ahead. And again, we can, we can, um, I've, I've set aside kind of the last 10 minutes or so at least for, for questions if we want to have that, that time, or we can just talk more about lessons. Um, but on the Chinese history piece, um, I was interested to know, I'm not a Chinese scholar at all, Africa is where I've done more of my research, um, but a friend of mine was recently talking with me and, and uh, was saying, well, you know, you don't have to organize China into dynasties. Um, and again, just as with Africa, we could also have a discussion about how do we bring China into the curriculum in an integrative way, how do we, how do we teach about China through the ages, um, and traditionally it has been done through the dynasties, and some of you have probably taught your students to sing the Frere Jacques song. Do I have any takers out there? Have you, have you, it's, there's a song out there that basically, and you don't want to hear me sing, um, that's the Chinese dynasty song to the tune of, of Frere Jacques, and, and I did include it for you on the big picture questions, uh, and so just learning the, the names of the dynasties. There's a new YouTube clip out there over the last six months, and I did include the clip, but it looked like I was being blocked from it this afternoon when I went to check it again. But it's basically uh, to the tune of um, Madonna um, singing Vogue, and she does this great Chinese dynasty song as well that has all kinds of information about each of the dynasties in with it. So I recognize, recommend both of those as teaching tools. But there's some new scholarship now that's saying that, that the traditional way of thinking about Chinese um, history through dynasties um, has a couple problems associated with it. And one of the articles that I gave you to read kind of identified a few of those problems. Um, so for example, the dynastic chronology doesn't allow necessarily for you to think about um, uh, when those changes and continuities actually happen. So the, the ends of the dynasties don't necessarily show when there were major breaks in, in the history of the technologies or the agricultural developments of the time. Uh, and so some historians have argued that it would be better if you did more of a political chronology. Um, and those political chronologies um, are, are largely the ones he offers are largely the same as the dynasties, although it breaks them up a little bit. So, for example, the Han Dynasty and the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty are split into two parts. And so you'll, you'll see um, some of the earlier developments and then maybe the, as, as, the, as that dynasty developed and then the changes that happened as a result. And I'm not going to repeat what was in the reading, but I think that it's just, again, you're asking students to to critique or to think about, does it make a difference in terms of the type of questions that we ask about Chinese history? And for those of you who were talking about earlier, you know, the, the economic development piece of it, yes, it, world history does, does tend to, too often, well, I think too often uh, to come around with economics. But the nice thing about that third one is it wasn't just economic, it really looked at the technological developments as well and the agricultural changes. And so because so much of China still is uh, revolves around agricultural changes um, or agricultural in labor, um, that that perhaps is a, mo a more important marker than what the government says or does. Um, and the fact that the there's these protests still um, in uh, in China, um, I think, is is an interesting one to discuss. Um, so I think that we can we can uh, certainly critique all three of those and and come up with some neat neat ways of of uh, working with our students on on thinking about time. You're getting a lot of endorsement for the political chronologies in the chat, Deb. Great. 
Good. Well, I think one of the things we want to do is just have our students really think about this larger, larger context of of thinking of of history. And I know we have at least one Chinese scholar on online tonight, based on the survey. And so I would love her to chime in if she'd like um, and uh, tell us about what what's happening on on that line of things. Um, but on the um, when we're thinking about any one of these, either specifically the African or the Chinese, or more generically world history, um, one of the, the things that periodization does allow us to do is to see those chunks, and I love that term, um, of what are the changes and continuities that are happening um, during that period. Um, can we compare those to other times and places where similar changes are happening or similar responses to global processes are happening? So when people are interacting for the first time or, or when diseases are spreading for the first time. Um, and then are there certain patterns or trends that are visible? And we'll look at, at one of the ways we can identify those trends in just a minute here. So uh, just on, on this one topic of periodization before we get into a couple multiple choice questions, um, one of the things you can do right at the beginning of the year to teach periodization to your students is critique their, their textbook. Um, and you could bring in some of your sample textbooks as well and actually just have them look at the table of contents, see whether or not they think that there's anything loaded about the way those periods are divided up, whether or not there's certain regions that are, are privileged more than others, whether or not there's certain dates that seem privileged. Um, and I'm going to expect that most of them are still going to be organizing it around 1914, 1945, and perhaps not um, with the discovery of oil. Um, but maybe, maybe things will change. Um, that, that's the problem with an online network. I don't know if any of my jokes are funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we have uh, the, so you can have, the, have students critique the textbooks. Do those debates that I mentioned, and both um, the, the, the debate activity is online there for you. There's another uh, lesson that is in the lesson packet that I've already put up there on the, on the, on the website, which is on um, writing a thesis. And so basically it asks students to learn how to write a thesis using the topic of periodization. So I could talk more about that if people are interested. But um, I wanted to go through um, two multiple choice questions. Some of you I know are, are involved with the AP World History exam, um, and um, others of you just, you know, I know use multiple choice questions in, in a variety of ways, either through the SAT2 or through other state testing. And I think these next two questions really do um, show how periods, periodization might be used effectively in a in a um, summative assessment type of approach, and so this is a a question that was on the original um, AP World History Test, and we're not going to spend today talking about the revisions that are coming up this next year. I think it's a good question. Um, I think, and but it does ask students to look at what are those major changes that are happening after the 1500s, and so they have to know roughly when these different events took place in order for them to answer that question effectively. Um, I haven't seen the answer coming up yet um, on the, the chat. Uh, so should we just eliminate the oh, great thing, Stephen? One, one person says B. And I B get would be it. correct. And that's correct. Um, hey, I got it right, too. Um, one of the things we work with our students on is thinking about how do we get them to, <coughs> excuse me, get rid of those other answers. And so if we could talk through maybe either in the chat or if somebody would like to um, speak up on their, and, and uh, ask Richard for the mic, um, I'd love to hear your rationale of how you would get students to answer this question correctly. Okay. And while we're waiting for people to click in, if they want to, Robert has given us um, talking about uh, the economic chronology of China. We've had a lot of discussion in the chat about how to divide up okay. Chinese history, which is appropriate since Chinese history is so vast. Great. Okay. Thank you, Roberta. That was... How would we, how would you work, how would you encourage <coughs> to work <coughs> through um, 
the uh, answer to this multiple choice question. How would you do that? Uh, no volunteers yet. Uh, you can have students talk about when each of the other events occurred. One way. So, for example, with the establishment of nation states, um, we would hope that they would, might be able to identify that as more typical of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly with the use of steamships. Um, what about interest in the Asian spice trade? Um, that may may have stemmed a little earlier there. We know Marco Polo and others were were, were looking eastward because of some of those trade that those Indian Ocean trade networks. Mm -hmm. um, the existence of the slave trade. Uh, that's vague enough that we know that the slave trade did exist much earlier in the Mediterranean slave networks um, with uh, um, Slavs for, uh, from along the Volga, and there were also trade networks uh, prior to the 16th century and prior to the transatlantic trade. So they could eliminate those other possibilities. Um, but this is the first time that we actually have, as we talked about with that commodity periodization, the extension of sugar production in the Americas. Um, this next question is one of the new types of questions that will be um, used with the AP test uh, following next year. Um, they're going to four responses, and I think that uh, be interested to see what you think is the difference, um, advantages, disadvantages, how might a student uh, process this question differently. We'll see who, who beats us to the punch in terms of, of the answer here. Okay. Steve um, Steven, Steve. Steven's in there again. So okay. he would be a correct answer. And in fact, one of the things that um, they're hoping with these new multiple choice questions is that they they are more skill based. So students will there'll be much less recall per se of, of specific information and much more of a reliance on the student ability to to really think about these wider conceptual questions. Uh, and in this particular question, one of the giveaways is is the fact that it's uh, incorporation of the Americas into a global network of exchange. Um, and uh, the fact that they were are asking is the beginning of a new period in world history, that does give it away. And I noticed a question coming up saying that this could be an easier question. And I think the intent is that, that students will be tested more on their skills. And one of the most important skills that the AP World History exam is emphasizing is chronological reasoning. Um, so you all are going to be all in good stead, um, given that that's the nature of this session tonight. Any questions about, um, uh, and so in, in a similar way, you would eliminate those other answers uh, with respect to the time periods, and, and, uh, and so we won't belabor that anymore unless people want to talk about it. Okay, we've got about a little less than half an hour, Deb. Great. Um, so uh, the recommendation I have here is just make periodization explicit in your course. Um, there is an additional activity in your, we've been able to talk about some of the lessons as you've gone, so this is, this is great. Um, there's an additional activity that I just got permission from the College Board to give you from a training session this past weekend um, that I just put, we put up there today. Um, that's, uh, I think it's labeled AP periodization lesson that actually asked students to critique whether or not 600 or 700 would be a better start date for that particular time period in world history. Really interesting lesson, gets kids thinking about exactly the kinds of questions and, and comments you all have been making in a very global way. So I encourage you to, to follow that up uh, as, a, as a potential lesson for next year. I wanted to spend just a minute talking about global historical context. This is something that we we might hear a lot or say a lot, and isn't always going to be um, easily understood by students. So what we want students to do is really understand what else is happening in the world at the same time, um, or what and and uh, that may have an influence on things. And um, just as a technology tool, this was a new thing I discovered a few weeks ago. There's something called uh, Tuxedo.com. Um, you can see the little uh, um, URL in the bottom right-hand corner of that image. And what you can do is, similar to Wordle, for those of you who have seen that, you can go to your to tuxedo.com 
and you can take any document as a Word document and throw in all those words to Tuxedo and create any shape you wanted to. So for example, you could use the Gettysburg Address and end up with Lincoln's face as an image that you could use on a PowerPoint or as a, as a picture for your, for your, for your classroom. Um, so what I did is I took the timeline of must know dates that you have up on your, uh, up on the website and just had them spell out the word date. And so you see what words come up the most often. Excuse me. Um, and so I thought that might be a, a cool technology tool that, that some of you might be able to follow up with. So let's brainstorm some activities for how we teach about time. And I would love really some more feedback here if you want to open up the mics here. Tell me how you teach about time, and then I'll go through a few more um, lesson, lesson ideas that you can use in your classes from what, from my, what I have as well. Okay. So. How do we teach about time? We've got a, a very uh, learned conversation going on here about the status of the Aztecs in the 1400s. But uh, now let's turn to this question. How, how do you teach about time? <coughs> uh, Beth says she likes to show the Carl Sagan clip of time. Um, if you, Beth, if you want to post the URL to that, if it's available online, uh, post it to the forum, that would be very helpful. That's a that's an easy thing to Google, I think, um, and you can have the calendar. It's a calendar, and it's it's a wonderful. You can use the calendar or the clip. It's it's really nice. Um, great suggestion. Okay. Any other suggestions about teaching time? Oh, you don't have the URL. Okay. Well, um, as as Deb said, you can Google it. Um, Carl Sagan clip of time. I suppose it gets you there. Yeah, and um, cosmic calendar is also a, you can use that as a as a word there. Cosmic yeah. calendar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. This particular image that you're looking at right here um, actually shows geologic time, and so it starts with the oldest rocks on on Earth, um, and then goes right through the epochs in a in that kind of spiraling way. So for the, those of you intrigued by the notions of big history, where we really are looking at all of all of history, and there is a movement afoot across the country right now to uh, have uh, big history courses being piloted in high school classrooms. And if you're interested more on that, please feel free to, to contact me. Exciting Megan project. writes, I was thinking that if you have them split, students split their lives into periods, it might give them a better sense of background and knowledge of trying to periodize broader history. Fantastic suggestion. I think uh, um, oftentimes at the beginning of the year, we're all trying to get to know our students. And one of the things that uh, some of us have done in the past is is have students do their own personal timelines. So I might ask my students to to choose in their long lives of of 15 years, um, choose the top 10 or 15 things that have happened to them already. They'll come in with those events the next day. They will have identified some global context alongside of those personal events that might have been um, moving or getting their first dog or or sibling or uh, divorce or, or whatever else has happened in their world, uh, and then they have to periodize their lives, just as as uh, the participants suggested, um, and so they actually try to periodize their life into to three parts, and then they they name those periods, and so oftentimes when they get to high school, it's the age of enlightenment, <laughs> um, or whatever other kind of, of names they come up with, or age of of confusion or or maturity or or whatever else for middle school. Or all and of that. So, so that lesson is actually attached in your lesson packet that you have. Okay. On your Jan notes that she thinks kids have a hard time understanding the change often occurs over a long period. She tells them the change didn't occur from a Monday to a Tuesday. And then picking up that theme, uh, Ginger Park notes that it would be interesting to have students make timelines of their parents' lives, give them a longer time frame, and they can also interview their parents. Great idea. Great. And I think this this is one of the things that we're challenged with when we're when we're teaching time. Um, we have students know how to write comparison essays, you know, something that happens at the same time. We know how students we have students writing maybe document based questions where they, they use evidence and can write a, a thesis using um, a variety of different prompts. But what they have a harder time doing is telling a story in a way that actually still proves the thesis. So how do they write that change 
and continuity over time essay. Um, how do they tell a story in a way that, that's actually going to prove a point over time and show those, those slow gradual changes that Jen mentions, um, as well as the same, the continuities that are still going to go along the, the way there. I have a, a few activities in your packet um, that talk about how you might teach change over time. There was a couple good readings I put up there um, on, on some of the, the ways in which you had, can help students develop graphic organizers um, that can point that, as well as how you can help students identify what are the, the uh, um, ways in which to organize those types of essays. It might be by periods, just as we've been talking about, or it might be more by impact statements, for example, like the social effects um, or the, the political effects or the, the cultural effects on something. Okay. So you know, notes that you can ask students to write about their grandparents' lives to an even longer timeline. Great. And I think that, you know, one of the one of the difficulties is Working with, I teach uh, freshmen and sophomores, and, and particularly with the freshmen, you know, we spend so much time um, working with them on these different kinds of skills that, that uh, you know, sometimes there's, you're torn between wanting to both teach the skills as well as, as move along in the content, and it's not about all content coverage, as we've talked about, but you still do have places you want to, you want to go. And so, you know, you choose your kind of moments of when you're going to step into those personal moments and, and you know, the personal grandparent parent moments um, carefully just because you, you also obviously want to be able to, to teach the, the content that you're working on. Um, and this is in part um, one of the skills I think that's important for students to, to do is developing uh, graphic organizers of some sort. Uh, many of you mentioned in your survey that the cause and effect piece is, uh, teaching cause and effect is something that, that's an important skill that, that many students have, um, but many students need to develop and oftentimes are the multiple choice questions on standardized tests uh, do reflect um, a need to know these causes and effects. Um, I would suggest a couple strategies here. First of all, the flow charts. Um, if you can imagine, and, and I can describe it briefly, but then I have a, an activity with it. Um, if you come up with several small factoids, for example, and it might be on, for example, the question, why did people settle down in the Neolithic Revolution? And so you might have 10 or 20 factoids, little slips of paper that have a diff different reasons on the story of, on, in the story of why people settled down over that long period of time that when those choices were being made. And they would have to take those slips of paper and put them in order and say glue them down actually on a big piece of legal paper. Um, and then show the connections between them, maybe with a solid line, which I've tried to indicate in yellow, um, or a dotted line, or no line at all if there's no connection between those effects. And just having them see that kind of flow chart with evidence over a longer time, and you can actually have them put it on a timeline, um, gives them that kind of, of sense of how do you think about cause and effect over that longer haul. Much more simple would be the kind of cause and effect graphic organizer that you've got in front of you. Uh, it doesn't show that same complexity, but I think that that the that the um, it does do the job, of particularly for for um, for more straightforward topics. And of course, we want to talk to students about multiple causality and how you can't necessarily attribute you know um, one event, you know, one cause to to uh, have one cause to a particular event. Um, the, the third idea that I listed here that for cause and effect I think is a, is one I've tried a couple different times. Um, some of you might be familiar with the theater of the oppressed teaching strategy where students will be role playing a particular issue and you can tap in and so a student can change the, the uh, comment that's being made by coming up to the skit of two or three people and, and being a different person or being the same person but making a different comment or, or and you can re do a rewind or a fast forward on this. Um, if I'm going too fast on describing that and that's not familiar, please, please uh, weigh in here. But for example, um, you might do a role play um, to look at the decision to stop the treasure ship voyages during the Ming Empire. And you could imagine perhaps a conversation between um, the Ming Emperor um, 
con, uh, Zhang, he, Zhang He, the the uh, the eunuch who was doing these voyages, and um, maybe a, a, a Confucian bureaucrat, and the three of them are having a conversation about whether or not to to what what should end those voyages or shouldn't they end those voyages. But then you could have students cutting in and changing those decisions or, or, or offering other variables in that process. So that might be a way of thinking about alternative history at the same time um, as, you know, what would have happened if that decision hadn't been made. And your, your mention of alternative history <clears throat> flows right into a comment in the chat uh, asking about, has anyone used counterfactuals as a way of teaching the connection between seemingly disparate developments over time? Uh, anybody's done that, again, please go to the forum, share those ideas with us. Okay, Deb, we have about 15 minutes. Great. Um, so here's a listing of a lot of the different activities that I have in your packet for you um, in, on, the, on the website, but I just wanted to talk through a couple of them and then um, offer up some possibilities for questions on them if, if, they're, if it's not clear. Uh, the first one is very simple, and I think I titled this uh, in the packet, From the mun Mundane to the Sophisticated. When I was teaching middle school originally, um, and I've done, done it also at high school, but I know there's several middle school teachers out there, so I wanted to make sure there were a variety of types of, of ideas here, um, is I used to find at Ikea um, some blank face clocks, so cheap plastic clocks. Um, that had no face at all on them, and you can use different um, numbering systems. So, for example, the Mayan numbers, the Arabic numerals, um, and the Chinese uh, numbering system, and actually use those numbers on the clocks, and then we set them up in the class, so we had three or four different time zones represented in the class, and based on different current events that were happening, we would have different cities being represented by each of those clocks. Again, very simplistic, but really, but, but students really got into that whole idea of kind of understanding the, the notion of, of time change, but also the fact that, that there are different numbering systems, and again, so basic, but, but hopefully something that might be of interest. Uh, we've talked about those next couple of ones. Um, one of the other things that I listed in your packet was a, a, one of the things I do on, on many of my more objective tests is something I call sequencing. And so I choose uh, five events that are in a, on the same theme of history, and I, I have students um, put those in order. And I, I don't choose ones that are very narrowly defined, usually, um, or, or very specific, but I, I, I'd rather choose ones that have, have uh, um, let's say, like the, the world religions. And so they might have to put the five religions of when they, they came about, five religions when they came about um, in order. Um, so, so again, it's not so important that they know the specific date, but that they know the general order of how that happened. Uh, and similarly, we talked about the personal timelines, but the human timelines would be, and you have this lesson plan in your packet, I would give them a list of key events in world history, eight, uh, 30 kids in the class, it would be 30 slips of paper, they would have to put themselves in order um, based on that event. So they wouldn't necessarily have to know the exact date. Great review activity at the end of a unit or at the end of the year. Um, and they just have this kind of physical timeline that's stretched out um, on um, on the the uh, across the classroom. Uh, we talked about narrative writing. I think time travel is really fun, and you can do this through editorials or you know newspapers. We've done oh, we've all done different ways in which we have students jump back into the past, um, and of course that that's a lot of uh, historical empathy pieces there. The last activity listed there is an end of the year review. Uh, students will will create thematic or regional timelines um, for world history. Again, a, a nice end of the year review activity that has them say, okay, what were the 10 most important events in African history from beginning to now? Or what were the 10 most important uh, events in environmental world history from beginning to now? And again, just the more they think about different ways of coming up with a thematically driven or a regionally driven timeline, and then thinking about what are those global, what else is happening. So having to identify the global context along the side there, I think is a valuable activity. 
Okay. Any anyone out there want to talk or anything in there? I need to. Questions? <clears throat> uh, we have um, uh, some folks talking about sequencing in their in their classes. And uh, Blair writes, I always try to create sequencing where they have to use their critical thinking skills instead of just uh, memorization. And so, Blair, if you could uh, post some of those suggestions to the forum, I think your colleagues would be interested in learning about them. Great. That's really helpful. And I wanted to, to finish up with this last activity, which I've actually kind of walked through here a little bit, just the way I would do it with my students. And sometimes these are spontaneous things that we do. Sometimes this is a planned thing. This is often something I do near the end of the year. And remember I said that not only do we teach the past and the present, we also should be having students think about the future. So these, these are future timelines. And you can do them on any topic um, that might be uh, coming up in your classroom. And so you would have them do a timeline on a topic up to today. And then it diverges into two branches, either preferred, what they think will probably happen, or what they would prefer to happen in the future. So again, you're having them predict the future based on the trend that they see from the past. And so, for example, um, on uh, Egypt, um, we could look at Egypt's revolutions in the past, and we could start with Muhammad Ali and the reforms or his, his uh, increased autonomy under the Ottomans. Um, go to Nasser taking over the Pan-Africanist movement, Suez Canal crisis, the Camp David peace talks, Sadat being assassinated, Mubarak stepping down, um, the constitutional amendment that was approved. Um, and then we could have them say, based on this history that we've seen over the last 150 years, where would we go next? And so um, what do they think will probably happen if they're going to be glass half empty, perhaps? Um, or what do they, would they prefer to see in the future? And so it might be, for example, uh, free and democratic elections happening in September in Egypt, um, or they might be more cynical and expect continued military rule and the loss of popular support for the government. Uh, so this particular lesson, uh, in terms of the timelines, I found to be really an effective way of getting students to think about those events in history that we all agree are significant pieces of evidence for helping them analyze the past, whether it be analyzing the past through chunks or out analyzing the past through, through patterns and trends. But then they actually have to do something with that, and that's going to help them with those 21st century skills that we're talking about, really analyzing and thinking critically about the media um, and not just, you know, um, disseminating information in the future. So, so does, uh, and so I, I would love to hear kind of how you might um, tweak or use future timelines in your own classroom, whether or not you think that it really is under our jurisdiction as history teachers to teach the future, or if that's just some other discipline completely. Um, or any other questions or comments that you might have at this point. And I, I, I think the timelines have been widely accepted. As um, Simone has pointed out, they call upon students to use their higher level thinking skills. And um, teaching ancient history, it would be almost more of a what would you change timeline. Good point. I think it so, drives home the idea that knowing the past can help us shape the future. Very good point. I think uh, as we as we think about future timelines in general, I think uh, that's absolutely correct. It, it does help us uh, draw on the future, and I think that it also um, gets a little bit of that alternative history. But I think even more so than than what the what could have been history, which I know there's there's varying feelings about uh, on that on that front of whether or not that's a good use of time. It has students. Think about what are the decisions that leaders make, that populations make, that you know the guy who burned himself in Tunisia made, um, that then might set different trajectories afoot. And so I think those are those are, are good questions for students to consider when they're thinking about cause and effect, when they're thinking about context and and on all the different kinds of concepts around chronological reasoning that we've been talking about today. Mm -hmm. And the future timeline also asks students to draw inferences and, and come to, to you know, uh, some kind of conclusion. Uh, <clears throat> Blair writes, of course, I'm now having trouble thinking of an example. He's talking about some of the earlier suggestions uh, that he was using about counterfactuals. Uh, mm -hmm. So 
Um, Deb, we've got just about six minutes left. Great. Oh, about sequencing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, that's um, these all. I, I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing all these comments um, coming coming up. Let me just walk through a few resources, and then we'll see if anyone else has any questions. Um, these are, are resources that some of you out there, I'm sure, are, are familiar with. Um, and I've just put a sampling here. I've got much more extensive lists that are up on the forum. Um, but I want to make sure that 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 I would. There were many of you on the survey that indicated that you felt as if there was a dearth of materials available and some of you don't have access or your students don't have that easy access to online sources uh, or text sources. And these are some of the sources that really provide some great um, materials. Um, the first one is an online um, journal that's been going for about, oh, I should, I think five or six years now, um, maybe longer, um, that is got great articles written really for teachers, uh, lots of hands-on ideas and lessons and content um, very accessible for students. The World His History for Us All site has fabulous um, um, materials, full units and lessons that were developed, um, that, that are developed for World History that can be tweaked up or down. World History Matters is a great site for primary sources. Um, and primary source analysis in particular on both gender as well as world history. And the Bridging World History site is a set of 26 different videos, and they're very talking head because it was a low budget project, but it's really good history and used in small doses, you know, those 10, 15 minute little vignettes and snippets, I think it can be, be they can be very effective and do a nice job of, of showing context and, and cause and effect. Um, two additional sources here, just in terms of those network kinds of places. Even if you're not teaching AP World History, um, getting on the AP World History listservs or going to summer institutes in the summer is a great way to um, develop your expertise in the field. And certainly um, lots of access to materials and summer reading lists and movies and books and everything else on there. And that's all free. Um, World History Association as well, uh, both their regional as well as their national and international conferences are also great places to be connected to um, those, those sources. Um, so uh, I will... I would love to take any questions that anyone else might have. Um, I'd also love to hear additional resources that you have. Um, but as I said, I have many more resources and monographs and books, uh, texts, et cetera, that are listed on those lists. Uh, it seemed that that was something that people were looking for. OK, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> any other comments, questions before we wrap things up? Uh, we've gone through a lot of really good material tonight. Uh, you folks have offered lots of good resources and suggestions. This is your last chance. We will monitor the form until April 15th, which means that if uh, there's some questions up there that uh, we need to respond to, we will do that. Um, if there's a lot of traffic on the form, we'll keep it up even longer than that. <clears throat> okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it looks as if we've come to uh, the end of our 90 minutes. I want to thank Deb for leading us very skillfully and clearly through a lot of complex material. And I want to thank all of you for your intelligent and engaged participation this evening. Please, before you sign out, um, don't forget your evaluations. Please uh, fill those out for us and send them back to us. They really are important. We pay attention to them. If any of you teach American history, look at our National Humanities Center online seminars. You can just type that in your browser, and it'll take you to our fall schedule. If you don't teach American history, please tell your American history colleagues about them and about the other National Humanities Center resources. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for a really excellent uh, seminar this evening. To escape our virtual classroom, you go up to the upper left-hand side of your screen, click the word File. There'll be a drop-down menu, and the last item there is Leave Session. Click on that, and you're home free. Thank you very much, and we hope to be with you again sometime soon. Take care, and good evening. Thanks very much.